Oh, thank you. I, I'm glad to be here. Um, always happy to talk about cyber warfare and topics like that. So I'm currently the director of the cybersecurity programs at Western Washington University. And we have a number of different programs in that. Uh, in the past, though, I spent 33 years in the Army, both active and reserve. The last 19 of those years were as a professor at the United States Military Academy at West Point. In addition to that, I spent some time working with uh, military intelligence and various other places in the Army, as well as I've had a, a rather full career in the civilian world, where much of what I've been done has been concerned with cybersecurity. Uh, thank you, Professor. So uh, this uh, malicious uh, cyber worm called Stuxnet, what was so historic? What was so special? What was so new about it? Well, really the most new and special thing about it was that it became known to the public. And it wasn't totally unique in that there had never been a cyber attack before. It wasn't unique in that it was a, a fairly um, focused and structured attack. Uh, what was unique though, was that we as the public became aware of it and became aware of what had been going on for some time in the, the secretive world of cybersecurity. And so I think that's probably the most unique thing about it. Uh, it wasn't the first act of cyber war. It wasn't, the, or that could be termed cyber war. Uh, but it was one that became very obvious very quickly out in the world. Uh, so uh, according to uh, my understanding of this, this was the first time that uh, something that was done in the, uh, 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 should I say, digital realm, you know, something like a line of code, a program, a malicious program was used to break, to actually break something physical, uh, uh, that that was the first time that it had happened. This is the first, that was the first time that we, we saw that happening. Uh, there had been other instances that were much more limited and, and uh, more detailed in scope. And in fact, probably most of the other instances that we've seen were combinations of cyber and uh, kinetic attacks occurring simultaneously, where the, the effects of the kinetic attack were enhanced by the cyber attack. Okay, and uh, going into the future, I imagine that, since that this is something uh, that's going to continue. Uh, for example, I believe in uh, 2017, uh, the Russians uh, attacked uh, three utility uh, uh, facilities in, uh, I believe it was in, uh, well, in, in Ukraine, they, they attacked three facilities and they were actually able to switch off power for over 2 million people. Uh, so is this something that we will see continue uh, into the future? Oh, we'll, we'll definitely see it continuing. It's been going on on an ongoing basis. Uh, it's been tried throughout the latest war uh, where the, the Russians have continuously attacked the power systems. We've seen the kinetic effects that's become more obvious. They've also made the attempts through the, uh, through the cyber world as well. So uh, generally what we can expect though is to see this combination of attempts both in the cyber world and in the physical world going on at the same time. Uh, how would you describe information warfare? Well, in information warfare is trying to control the actions of your enemy through controlling information. That could be by providing specific information. That could be by denying access to information from for an enemy. Uh, it could be through information provided to the populace of the enemy, or it could be information direct, provided directly to the enemy. That information may or may not be correct, but uh, we're, we're trying to influence the enemy to take the actions that we want through the use or denial of information. So the use of information in war is, isn't new, is it? Uh, even before computers, uh, uh, intelligence uh, uh, services were using disinformation, misinformation, and propaganda uh, uh, as a tool of war. Oh, oh, definitely. It, it goes as far back as, you know, 
you start looking at the, the histories and they started talking about, for example, when uh, the, the, the Persians were coming towards the Greeks and uh, they said, we will cut them down like the pine trees, right? <laughs> and so they went and consulted with the Oracle at Delphi and what does he mean by cut them down like the pine trees? And the Oracle says, well, those are the kind of trees that when you cut them down, they don't grow back. And so <laughs> there was an attempt to use information to... You know, You're referring to Leonidas? Yes, yes. Intimidate the... Intimidate your enemy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you can make your enemy scared through the use of information, you've accomplished a lot. Now, now the Greeks didn't really believe that that would happen and they went on to eventually win that war. Uh, but yet we saw the use of information warfare going on there. So. so what specifically is cyber warfare? Well, cyber warfare is different from information war and it's different in that cyber war is warfare that's conducted through the use of electronic means, through the use of the internet, through the use of cyberspace and we got to be a little careful because sometimes cyber war and information war overlap and sometimes you use cyber operations in order to accomplish information warfare objectives sometimes you use information warfare objectives to accomplish cyber objectives and so they're in between um, and and then there's another one out there which is electronic warfare where we're trying to use electronic means to disrupt communications. And so if I'm disrupting communications and it's only voice, that's just electronic warfare. But if the communications channel I'm disrupting is carrying internet traffic or network traffic, now okay, I've got doing something within the electromagnetic spectrum, would that count as uh, 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 an example of that? Yeah, any kind of attack in the in the spectrum would be an electronic warfare but only those that at directly affect the network become cyber warfare. And okay. So they're, they're different realms, but they're very much overlapping. Yeah. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, you could, in fact, uh, most times information warfare is used within cyberspace, uh, uh, many times. Many, many times the, we we're, we're use cyber warfare to accomplish information warfare objectives or we use information warfare sometimes to accomplish cyber warfare objectives. Uh, for, for example, if, if, if I want to accomplish an information warfare objective of denying information to the enemy, then I can use a denial of service attack, right? And I can go out and attack their ability to go get that information off the internet. Uh, on the I mean, it sounds really rudimentary, right? I mean, you know, uh, denial yeah. of service, that's old, isn't it? There, there's there's a lot that, you know, we, we see coming back again that um, we just see it in different forms. And, and we start thinking about, you know, we're in the modern world. We've got new worries. The things that we're thinking about now are things that nobody worried about before and everything else like that. Uh, but... Yet we go back and look at our history and look at Aeneas Tacitus, who was a, a strategian who um, was in Rome, a Greek in Rome, writing about Greek warfare strategies for the Romans about uh, 400 years before the Common Era, 2400 years ago. And you start reading his treatise and you come to a chapter on passwords. And the Did you say passwords? Passwords, yes. <laughs> okay. And the problems with using passwords and using them properly and even bringing about the potential for using multi-factor authentication in, in that. So, and yet 2,400 years later, we're still talking about passwords and the problems with passwords and how to, how to deal with that. And so, so another... Another uh, 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 another kind of attack I understand that's used in cyber warfare is ransomware. Uh, um, you know where you encrypt all of your uh, your target's data and request a ransom. But I mean, if you're if you're using ransomware as a tool of cyber warfare, 
you, you're not really asking for a ransom, are you? Right, and 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 this is more destructiveware that we we see that's doing that. Ransomware is more of a cyber crime type of thing where the criminals, you know, their their goal is to get money. Uh, in, in in cyber war, if you're trying to do that, you're more trying to destroy the information or the systems of the enemy. So you don't bother with the the ransom. You just have the same type of software that would go and make the ransomware attack, but you just have it wipe the wipe the hard drive, wipe the information out and, and try and just completely destroy it because you don't need the, the reward or, or, or that. And now it's the same software for the most part that does the both of those acts. It's just one, there's no expectation that you're ever gonna recover. And, and no need to go chase the the, the money coming out of it. Okay. Um, and, and we actually see those applied by the same people. Uh, one of the things that Russia does is Russia is, tries to supplement their cyber force with these these criminal gangs that are tolerated and but they're expected then to go and cooperate in times of war and to work on the side of the Russians. Yeah, probably with groups that. like the San Warum is probably one of them. Yeah, where, where you know, they develop the stuff for their criminal criminal activities, but then they can deploy it in wartime and, and on the side of the Russians. Well, a specific uh, 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 ransomware attack, uh, which was attributed to uh, the Lazarus group uh, out of North Korea, uh, it wreaked havoc across many organizations across the world. Uh, but the irony was that uh, there was already a patch. Microsoft had created a patch for the particular vulnerability uh, uh, that uh, allowed this attack uh, to be possible. Um, the fact that this affected so many companies uh, around the world, what do you make of the fact that they didn't patch uh, this vulnerability, even though there was a patch available? Yeah, I, I think there's been a big problem in the past that's getting better, but it's still not completely resolved yet. But but a big problem of people uh, having the awareness that you need to keep up with and keep patching things and, and keep your systems up to date. And a lot of companies didn't make that connection that they could be vulnerable and they look on it as an expense. I've got to spend all this time bringing all my systems up and I've got to do this. And, and they didn't do a good risk analysis of what can happen if I don't do that. And as a result, they, they found themselves caught with, with, with their pants down or with their uh, patches down and left themselves wide open for this kind of vulnerability. And it just, was carelessness, but carelessness that was accepted and allowed because they hadn't seen that happen before. And, and, you think things and, have improved since then? I think a lot of things have improved. I don't think they've improved everywhere. Uh, it, it's going to take a few more before everybody starts coming on board with it. Uh, but once people start getting that feeling that they, they need to do this and they're under a, a continuous threat, then we'll see that people will, will start doing it. Uh, uh, you, you, uh, sorry, uh, please continue. Yeah, I say if, if you look at the, the um, situation in the Ukraine right now, they're under continuous threat and they're under continuous attack, but yet they are being very resilient in the face of that attack because they've they realize the necessity of keeping their systems up to date, of keeping their defenses up, and they've done a very good job of continuing that and not letting things go and not letting things slip. You go find any Ukrainian system, you're not going to find any vulnerabilities that have already been patched sitting on them. Uh, and, and we need to spread that kind of uh, preparedness and, uh, and awareness to the rest of the world and that'll take care of a lot of those problems that we're seeing out there. 
which leads me into uh, my next question of unknown vulnerabilities, uh, what we refer to as zero day vulnerabilities. Uh, describe the concept of zero day. Yeah, and, and the idea is, is that we go out or somebody goes out and finds a vulnerability that nobody else has discovered yet. And so it's a vulnerability that's been found before it's been brought to the notice of the makers of the software. So they don't haven't had yet the opportunity to go and make a patch and fix that. And so because there is no patch for it, now when I have that zero day, I have a chance to go out and exploit a vulnerability that nobody has yet had an opportunity to patch. And so I, I have a weakness that I can take advantage of. Now, what happens is, is if I'm the bad guy, if I'm if I'm a, or if I'm a cyber warrior, I have to sit and think about well, what am I going to do with that vulnerability? Am I going to you know let the the vendor know so that they can go and fix it, or am I going to go out and actively exploit that and see how much money I can make for myself? Or am I going to hold that vulnerability, that knowledge that I have of that vulnerability really close so that if I'm in a, a, a situation in a warfare type of situation, I can exploit that vulnerability that nobody knows about, but I know about and I've got it sitting in my back pocket ready to attack at the right time. Well, of course, there's a chance that someone else could always stumble upon that vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. There, there is that chance, yes. And so I've got to weigh that risk of, you know, is it better for me to hold it until I need it? Is it better for me to exploit it immediately? Or is it better for me to have the vendor patch it immediately? But if you have, if, if, if you uh, discover a zero day vulnerability, uh, I understand that there are brokers now that legally sell uh, zero days. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to hide, do you? Well, I mean, to make a transaction, to try to sell, to try to sell the knowledge of a zero day to, uh, I believe one of the companies, uh, involved in this is called Zerodium. Uh, they're a zero day broker. Uh, and, uh, you know, anyone in the industry would know what they're, what they're, what they're selling or what they're buying. So, uh, why? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. You don't necessarily know what you're buying. You have an idea of what you're buying and you hope that you're buying what you think you're buying. Um, so I can describe things in a, a term where you have somewhat of an idea of what I've got, that I've got something of value and then I can sell that to you. You know, if, if you're the, the person that makes the software, you might want to buy the vulnerability from me because you want to go and patch your system. If you're a bad guy, you want to buy the vulnerability from me because you want to go exploit it in others. And although it, you know, we can say that the market is legal, the, the one of the questions becomes, well, legal maybe, but ethical, uh, that becomes a, an entirely different matter. And, 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 you know, is there an ethical uh, way to, to, to buy and sell vulnerabilities? Uh, well, I, I would argue that possibly there's a ethical to buy a vulnerability if it's on your own software, ethical to sell it if you're an independent researcher and the only place that you'll sell it is to the vendor of that software and you're only selling it because you're trying to make up for the cost that it took you to go and and discover that vulnerability. But the line between uh, the bad guy and the good guy is not that defined. I mean, it's not it's, it's blurry. I mean, if you're a military, you 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 would want uh, zero day vulnerabilities to develop your cyber weapons. Does that mean you're a bad guy? It, it not necessarily. No. And, and it means you're a bad guy if you're not one of us, but it means you're a good guy <laughs> if you're one of us. Right? <laughs> and, and, and so there, there is that little bit there, but then we don't really want, our military really doesn't want to get into bidding wars with other militaries to 
by these vulnerabilities. They'd much rather see them go to the, the, the software uh, makers and get them patched. Uh, given, given the choice, you know, that's what they're going to do with the vast majority of the vulnerabilities that they acquire either through discovery on their own or through some other means. Uh, is, is they're going you're to saying they usually report vulnerabilities? Oh, yes. Yes. Vast majority of all vulnerabilities found are by the military are reported to the, the, the software manufacturers. It, it's only in very rare exceptional cases that they'll, uh, they'll hold on to it. In fact, to do so requires a fairly significant um, review up through various echelons of, of, of the services in order to go through that, what they call it the equity process. Mm -hmm. Sounds like they're selling you know, stocks <laughs> or something. Uh, <laughs> but but it, it's a pretty involved process that we, to make that determination of, should we hold on to this to be able to exploit it? And it's only in very rare circumstances that that ever actually happens uh, with with the U.S. side. Uh, would you would you say that uh, the Russians are very good at weaponizing information? Uh, and uh, w w one thing that comes to mind is uh, it's uh, the, the the all the fake news that they, uh, they 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 flooded on social media in 2016 during the U.S. general election. And uh, and their their uh, the, the, how they they, they published the uh, emails uh, of uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign manager, um, those kinds of things. I mean, I don't know if it takes you know real skill to do something like that because the way they got into the, the DMC was just you know using a phishing attack, which is which is pretty simple. Yeah. And, so and, you say they're, they're good at weaponizing information or just more willing to weaponize it? I, I think there's, there's probably a combination of both. I think in the past, they have been very good at weaponizing information, and they've also been very willing to do it. I think one of the things that we've been seeing in the last few years, and particularly uh, as in, in the run-up to the last war and, and during the war, is they've been increasingly failing at being able to weaponize the information. And one of the things that's been, we've been doing and we've seen our allies doing that's been very good about countering that ability of theirs to weaponize information is the opening and freeing and dissemination of information. Now, the more open information is, the more available it is, the harder it is for somebody to control it and, and try and weaponize it. And well, so I mean, we making start... information uh, available is one thing, but some people, in fact, many people just go to one or two sources for the information. That makes it easy to to kind of uh, 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 use this information on, on such people, right? It, it does in the short term. Uh, but while there's a lot of people that will only use a limited number of sources, there's enough people going to different sources that when something gets strong enough and overwhelming, they're even going to start leading those limited sources into the right direction. And, and, and so we don't need to have everybody in, you know, if we've got 10 people and half of them are only going to one source, the other half can start pulling those people and pushing the information to them and start getting them pointed in the right direction. And, and, and pretty soon their sources are gonna change and start opening up too. Um, well, uh, there are many governments around the world now are developing a uh, uh, cyber capability. Uh, in fact, uh, some governments even have dedicated cyber units, you know, uh, the Israeli 8200, the US Cyber Command, uh, uh, the the uh, North Korean Lazarus Group, uh, yeah, I believe APT One uh, from the uh, Chinese uh, uh, People's Liberation Army. So, is this a trend that we're going to see continue, even among countries, even among poorer countries that don't necessarily have kinetic uh, 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 capabilities? Oh, oh yeah, definitely, because cyber has the ability to. You know, it's one of those force multiplier things. 
where if I can I can punch above my weight in cyber, but uh, by, by having a, a small but very capable organization that does it, and so it's it's a much lower investment than a lot of the the big weapon systems and things like that, and and so if I can use that, then I, I have an advantage. Uh, I can spend less money and get more capabilities. I can get more things out of it. So, so we're, we'll, we'll see the continuing of the growth of, of cyber organizations within uh, militaries and, and, and within government structures and things. So in a sense, that does kind of levels the playing field, doesn't it? Uh, you know, I mean, if you're a small country and you have a really good cyber uh, uh, cyber capability, you might be able to, to deliver a punch that might actually uh, uh, be, you know, really destructive to a country that's genetically more powerful than you are. It, it it does do some of the playing field leveling. Of course, then when you start running into the countries with the strong cyber defense forces and the strong uh, ability to punch back in the cyber world, um, you're still going to run up against where you're still going to be at a disadvantage as a small country. That reminds me, uh, I, I understand that the, the Stuxnet worm uh, used four zero days, and that sounds extremely expensive. Uh, I think that's why many people believe that uh, it was created by a major world power or more, one or more major world powers. Yeah. And, and, and that is an expensive one to, to use that many zero days. And, and you know, one of the things we saw with the Russians again, as they started off the, the, the Ukrainian war, they ramped up and decided to go out and make, take some real uh, strong steps in, in cyber warfare and make some cyber attacks uh, against the Ukrainians and against things in general. But one of the problems they had run into is they had pretty much used up their zero days. And so they didn't have any big real surprises. They had some software that had been changed and updated with minor stuff, but but the, the, the big vulnerabilities were not there. So that helped make what they were trying to do very much more ineffective than it would have been otherwise. Uh, you know, that was part of their problem with using all of these uh, criminal related groups as a part of their cyber forces the criminal related groups had no incentive to hold on to their zero days because they wanted to go out and make money right away, right? And so they use their cyber, their, their zero days. And then the wartime comes and what, chest is empty, no more zero days, uh, but we'll rework some of what we've got and we'll go out after it. The, the other interesting thing along that line is that after a few months, we saw a lot of the criminal gangs of the Russians kind of fade away from the fight, the cyber war fight, and go back to their criminal activities because it turned out they weren't making much money on going out and doing cyber war. Uh, so, so they had to go back and start earning some more money from their more traditional types of attacks and things. So with uh, the digital age uh, came, you know, the ability for people uh, to launch cyber attacks. Do you think, uh, do you think it's a realistic consideration for governments to start moving back to analog systems? No, no. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's probably always good to have some backups, you know, some uh -huh. paper for this and some paper for that and maybe a few am radios here and there and stuff oh, so it's not like it is in the movies huh <laughs> no, no but the, the, the problem is is even with all the problems that we have and the vulnerabilities and everything the, the the digital world is so much more effective and and has so much more capacity than the analog world that it just doesn't pay to go back into into the analog world and, and, and back onto paper. So, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, so Saudi Arabia, the Saudi state was accused of using uh, some platform, uh, some uh, 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 monitoring platform 
uh, uh, to to Seville, uh, the, the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, uh, that was just before he was lured into the consulate in Istanbul and murdered. He, uh, it was found out uh, there, the Saudis are also accused of uh, of monitoring his family and his relatives, his friends, uh, with with the same platform. This flat this platform uh, is called Pegasus, and it was uh, created by an Israeli uh, a group, an Israeli firm called NSO Group. So uh, it's common knowledge that uh, the Saudi government is not exactly, you know, a democratic government that they go after dissidents uh, with a vengeance. Uh, what could be done to hold accountable firms like NSA Group uh, who create these kinds of powerful platforms and don't do uh, proper due diligence before selling them to their client governments? That's a, that's a really hard one. Uh, the, the problem is, how are we going to do due diligence? And, you know, how do we look and see what the real intent of the organization that's buying one of these tools from us actually is? You're saying us as in NSO group? Yeah. So, say, say I have a tool that I could sit here and, 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 and push a button and knock anybody off the internet or hear any conversation of anybody on the internet anywhere. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so I made that tool. And now I want to sell it. Okay. So are there legitimate uses for a tool like that? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Cause knock a terrorist off the internet or listen to what a terrorist wants. Right. Okay, so now I'm going to have an audience for people that want to buy that tool for me. And, and so if, if somebody comes to me from, from a, 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 a government and says, I want to you know, buy this for our intelligence service, uh, okay, I can sell it to you. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to go check and see if I'm, you're on my list of good countries and, and you know, make sure that, that I'm happy with you. And so then I, I see you're on my list there. And then you turn around and sell it to some country that's not on my list. So this is, this is a, you don't think, you don't see this, this particular problem being solved, do you? I, I don't think so, because the other thing is, if I know what your tool can do and I know somewhat how it does it, I can have somebody else build me a duplicate of that tool. Okay, okay, understood. And, and, and so trying to limit tools and limit access to tools, it, it gets, I mean, we can try that and do that to an extent, but but there's a very limited extent of where, where I can do that. Besides which, I would rather have you buy the tool from me than somebody that made a copy of it. Because one of the things I can do is I can put a back door in that tool. Right. And if I find that you're using it improperly, I can shut it down, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and But if you go buy the same tool from somebody else, I no longer have that back door. Right. But then I have to decide where is the point where I should use that back door. Because as soon as I use that back door once, now you're going to go find somebody else to give you the tool. And, and so, yeah, there's there's some real careful considerations there that I got to think about. So one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest problems that uh, security uh, uh, security people, uh, cybersecurity people face is uh, the the problem of uh, attribution, trying to uh, to trace an attack to the exact origin, and that is one of that's that is one of the hardest things they hard they have to do. Uh, do you see attribution becoming more precise, more granular? I, I think that's always a growing trend because one of the things that we will be doing is we will be watching for general things that we can use then in order to apply attribution later and, and so we we can start 
you know, monitoring, so to speak, the highways to see who's driving in and out on the internet to see who then we can we can say, well, you know, we just saw, you know, country X's people driving in on the internet. Um, and then this happened. Now we have part of the means in order to go refine and provide some of that attribution. And, and so, you know, we, we start learning as we have problems. We have problems doing attribution now. So instead of waiting for each incident to start and, and then trying to handle each of those incidents, we can start building some of the tools to start collecting the things that we're going to need for attribution as that goes along. Okay, but at this point, uh, it seems to be a very difficult, in fact, uh, uh, from uh, Arizona State uh, Global Security Initiative, uh, Dr. Nadia Bliss, I believe said that even in, in attacks that are very well studied, uh, attribution is not stated, at least not explicitly, you know, to say the attack definitely came from here. And that poses a problem, you know, one of the problem it poses is that uh, if someone attacks you and you feel that you've co correctly attributed uh, the attack and attack that person, there's always the chance that uh, uh, you might be attacking uh, or, or exacting revenge on the, on the wrong entity. Exactly. Yeah, that's a big challenge and a big problem. And, and that's part of the reason why we want to start building uh, the tools to be able to watch and be able to make sure that our attributions are correct and our attributions are more refined and better. Now, of course, part of the problem is if we're trying to build that system to help support our future attributions, we're, we're being somewhat intrusive in doing that. Okay. Uh, we're well, going to uh, have to collect some information that's going to be somewhat intrusive, right? That's correct. Um, well, uh, let's take a, a two minute break and we will be back. I am just going to run a commercial. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to Robert's e-commerce solutions. To promote your business or upcoming event on social media platforms, Roberts E-Commerce Solutions can help. Ensure your peace of mind by calling Roberts E-Commerce Solutions. From the intricacies of unleashing social media campaigns to scaling up visibility for your business by leveraging the use of Facebook-owned parallel platforms, Instagram, and WhatsApp, Roberts E-Commerce Solutions promises expertise. We can create and deploy promotional videos, flyers, and other digital assets concurrently, creating a multi-pronged approach that delivers visibility. For video promotions, we can use compelling motion graphics templates such as titles, intros, outros, transitions, logo reveals, and other elements to bring the essence of your ideas to life. Besides creating digital assets, we also understand how to navigate across the various business components contained within Facebook's Meta Business Suite, an appliance that centralizes and links Facebook to Instagram and WhatsApp, as well as the resulting analytics that can all be viewed on a single dashboard. Meta Business Suite allows small businesses the ability to effectively launch targeted ads based not only on geography, but also on demographics and the interests of potential customers. To schedule a free consultation, call 6827-850847 or email info at consult-res.net. Roberts E-Commerce Solutions. Empowering small businesses and nonprofits. Thank you. If you're just joining us, you're watching Insight. And today uh, we are discussing cyber warfare. And I have as my guest, uh, uh, Dr. Eric Fredham of Western Washington University. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Fredham, so uh, going into the future, uh, do you uh, think that uh, militaries who do not develop uh, cyber capability or coherent cyber strategy uh, will will lose, will be at a significant disadvantage? 
But I, I believe you're you're correct there. Uh, w without at least the cyber defensive capabilities, they're they're definitely going to have a problem uh, trying to keep their systems even functioning and going. Uh, for some organizations, it will be a little better because some of their systems are old and don't aren't as dependent on the internet. But especially for any military that's trying to be modernized and take advantage of all that digital systems can offer, that's going to be a huge problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, you uh, in one of your uh, correspondences to me, you quoted uh, Carl von Clausewitz uh, uh, on war. Uh, uh, he said, oh, war is a continuation of politics by other means. Were you implying that this also applied to cyber war? Uh, oh, definitely, yes. Uh, and, you know, people sometimes ask, they say, we have a Department of Defense, why don't we have a Department of Peace? <laughs> the reality is we do. We have a Department of Peace. It's called the State Department. And it's got inside of it all of the peace warriors, the, the diplomats and ambassadors and all of these other people that are part of the, are part of the Department of State. And it's only when the Department of Peace fails that we have to bring in the Defense the Department, Department in order to, to protect us and stuff. And, and so, you know, if you think we don't have a Department of Peace, you're, you're mistaken. It's just, it isn't always effective, right? Mm -hmm. We wish it was. We wish diplomacy was the answer. We wish treaties were the answer. We wish agreements among nations were the answer. But it turns out that it doesn't always work that way. And sometimes we have to apply other means than diplomacy in order to reach our end game or in order to protect ourselves. Okay. What does it mean for an organization to reduce its vulnerability surface? Yeah. And, and the idea there is that every time that we have a system or a program or a function that's exposed to the internet, uh, we've increased the surface, we've increased the number of places that our systems, our computers and our networks can be attacked. And so that's our vulnerability surface is the various areas that are that we can be attacked. And if we're thoughtful about how we expose ourselves to the internet, how we run which programs we run, which things we run, we can start reducing the vulnerabilities and reducing the surface that we have exposed to the to the, the internet. So in a sense, uh, cybersecurity is all about reducing a vulnerability surface, that there is no such thing as fully secured, a fully the, secure yes. system, yeah. network, computer. Exactly, like I tell my students, you know, the cost of cybersecurity security is, you know, endless and all consuming. We can always be spending more money fixing yet another vulnerability or fixing yet a, yet another uh, problem. And, and, but our goal is to reduce our risk, take those steps that we can to bring our risk down to within an obtainable level, a manageable level where you know, the potential cost to us is less than uh, what we will break us, right? And so we, we do it by, you know, making sure that we don't expose assets that are too large. We make sure we take care of those known vulnerabilities that are out there and fix them. We know, make sure we don't put things on the internet that don't need to be on the internet. We, we go and reduce the risk wherever we can and try and manage the risk rather than, well, I'm going to be the perfect internet person and have no vulnerabilities whatsoever. That's never going to happen. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the uh, foundation of the internet, of the current internet, ARPANET, was, was it built with security at the inception, with, in, with security in mind, because my, my understanding is that that's, security is really an afterthought as far as IP version 4 goes. It, it is, but it didn't need to have been. And 
there were those of us that were arguing for from almost the very beginning that we needed to incorporate security as a part of the internet. Uh, we needed to incorporate security as a part of the baseline protocols. I mean, the, the internet, the ARPANET was built in the first place as a secure network to try and route around problems and dangers and everything else like that. But we forgot or we, we got ignored when we were started asking to put some security measures into it. And, and, and I think there was a feeling then, um, you know, in the early years of the internet among people that it would be a place where we would all get along as a great happy family. <laughs> And there was no need for security because we were all, you know, equal well, citizens yes. of the network, and nobody would betray each other. And and you know, it was just sing kumbaya and get along. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody ended up coming to the internet with that same attitude. So well, had that been the case, had security, had security been built into uh, the foundations of the internet, into ARPANET, uh, how different would we, how different would the internet look uh, right now? Ah, that, that is so hard to predict. Um, you know, we, th there are things that we wouldn't have, you know, some of the social media is, you know, us going out and exposing our passwords to everybody, right? Mm. That's what Facebook is. It's a big password harvesting <laughs> place. Um, because when you ask somebody a password, what's the first to make a password? The first thing they do is take something that's meaningful to them exactly. and use that to base their password. Yeah, you just have to know them to guess their password. Yeah, as, as, as long as, and so to know them, you just read their Facebook page or whichever, you know, MySpace, if they're older. Or... But, I, 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 but I think the idea of, <clears throat> the idea of, uh, of using uh, phrases to create passwords, I think it's catching on. A lot of big organizations are trying to, to ingrain that into their, their, yeah. their employees, into their workers. So I see more and more, you, you know, I mean, uh, 10, 20 years ago, you'll see password, like password one, you know what I mean? Come on. Oh, oh, that's still the number one password on the internet. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Wouldn't you say it's, it's improved? Because I notice a lot of people use phrases, they use special characters, which makes it harder for, say, a brute force attack. Uh, well, to, the the to, special to characters don't really do much of anything. Oh, really? It, it, because we've gotten so used to using them that everybody knows an at's an A. Oh, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and so that, that really doesn't do anything. But if we go look at the top 100 uh, passwords used on the internet every year. Uh, the top 20 doesn't change very much at all uh, from year to year. And, and, and password one is usually the top. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it, it, it varies and, and we'll, we'll see something like one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, but you know that's the biggest variation. The biggest variation actually in the top 20 is uh, the big um, movie of the year. So, you know, one year it's Batman, next year it's Superman, uh, next year it's Wakanda. Uh, and, 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 and so if you know what the big movie of the year is, you've got one of the top 20 passwords for that particular <laughs> year. So now the good thing is if you look at the top 100 passwords, 10 years ago, that represented about 70% of the passwords on the internet. Now it's probably down to about 30%. So it's still a massive amount of them, but, but it's getting better, slowly improving in, in, in the numbers that, that are out there now. Well, I'm not even... Oh, sorry, go ahead. One of the interesting ones was there was one... Uh, a, a couple of years ago that turned out, looked like it was a really great password. I can't remember the exact thing of it, but it was some, ran, looked like a random string of letters. Um, and, and so everybody's, hey, we got, we got through to people. They're using, but 
for some reason they're all using the same random string of, of, of letters. Mm -hmm. Well, a little deeper analysis looking at it, and if you know how people type their uh, in, in, in Mandarin on the keyboard, you know, they, they hit a key and then some selections come up, they hit the next key and they build their- Like list. suggestions. Yeah, and, and, and so it turned out that this, quote, random set of letters was actually Chinese for my password. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, one thing that could help, you know, uh, if social media platforms start forcing strong passwords, I mean, a lot of organizations do that. Uh, if you work for a big organization, you probably can make password one your password. You're not allowed to do that. You have to follow the password creation rules. Uh, if 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 uh, if social media platforms start to do that, don't you think it will improve? Which means that even if you want to create a weak password, you're not allowed to. Yeah, and, and, and that would be great if they they would do that and start enforcing that, start training people how to make good passwords to use. Now, the other problem though that we run into is password sharing, and and not sharing with other people, but sharing among the accounts. And so I go out and I get a password and I make myself a good password and I and use it, it for my bank. Your <laughs> hmm? <laughs> and, and I use it for some social media and then I use it for some little obscure thing somewhere else and it gets compromised there. Now all of a sudden they can go try it against my bank, try it against my social media and boom, because I use the same password everywhere, mm -hmm. it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, and 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 uh, uh, I, I guess you know if security is layered. So, for example, uh, they have your password, but if they try to log in, they have to to go through a two-factor authentication, then they're stuck. So, I guess that's why layering security makes sense. Uh, Definitely, yeah. Which leads me to my next question: Describe the concept of defense in depth. Yeah, and, and that's the idea that we. We know that whatever we do is going to get broken. Whether it's a password, whether it's a, a, um, a multi-factor authentication, whether it's a, a firewall out on our system, we, we know that it's gonna get broken. But what we want to do is make it harder because instead of breaking one thing in order to get to our digital assets, we make it so they have to break several things. Okay. Right. And hopefully they, they, they know how to break one, but they don't know how to break the next. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, we can build that layers of defense so that, and maybe they get to the easy stuff. They get into our social media account, but they don't get into our bank account. Okay. Uh, and, and we make it, you know, hard for them. To, the more valuable something is to us, the harder we make it for them to get in. How would you describe the dark web? Um, dimly. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, the idea of the dark web is that, you know, there, there's a place where uh, people do untoward things out there on the internet and they try and build it in, in a way that uh, avoids their getting caught. Uh, whether it's through through the use of different tools or throwaway accounts or all of these kind of things. And, and, and so the challenge is you don't want to get caught, but at the same time, you want to let yourself be known so that the other bad guys can go out and find you, right? So uh, that's where we start looking at Tor and, you know, onion routing and all that kind of stuff, uh, where I can put out some sort of of address that people can get to, but yet that doesn't tie directly to me and stuff. Um, okay. And I understand that's one of the most secure way people go to the dark web using Tor. Uh, yes. Which is essentially uh, uh, very secure. It has the potential to be very secure. Uh, were I a criminal, I would not trust it myself. Um, 
because it turns out that Tor has some very significant vulnerabilities in itself. Uh, if, if particular, if you own enough of the nodes in a Tor network or so, selected uh, key nodes in a network, uh, you can actually use that to track where people are going through the Tor network. And actually read their, okay, actually see their traffic, uh, the, the not encrypted, to, to, are you able to view their traffic unencrypted? Well, no, you, you, you won't necessarily be able to view their traffic unencrypted, but what you'll be able to view is who is going where and who is doing the, what kinds of things. You can see the metadata. Okay. And, and from the metadata, you can start to piece together what's really going on and what's happening. And, okay. and, and so then that gives you the ability to figure out who did it and what it was that they did. But even on the surface web, uh, what's to, to uh, on the surface web, for example, if I were using a regular browser, Internet Explorer, whatever, and I were to find the IP address of uh, a proxy server, say, in Paris, and I entered that into the proxy settings of my browser, that makes it look like my computer is sitting in Paris. What's to stop me from committing a crime that will not be led back to me? Well, somewhere that proxy knows where you really are. Right mm -hmm. inside of that proxy, it has to translate from what it's pretending you are in Paris to what you really are, wherever you're sitting. Okay, and so once someone has the proxy server, they can find out where I am. Right, right. Now you could go through several layers of proxy to make it harder. It just means they have to then trace back all the way through all those proxies to find where you really are. Okay. Uh, do you think there will ever be uh, a framework, an international framework that defines, that clearly defines what an act of war is, a cyber act of war, uh, so that there's no, no misunderstanding that, you know, all of the countries involved, you know, once they see a cyber act of war, there is no disagreement on what it is. Uh, do you think that an uh, international framework uh, uh, to come up with something like that will ever be possible? Would there also be a framework uh, for how to uh, uh, respond in a proportional manner, not nothing heavy handed, but so using a more measured uh, uh, retaliation, say not, you know, not uh, 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 bombing a country because they broke into a bank, you know, something like that. So will we ever have clear guidelines, international guidelines on what constitutes a cyber act of war and what a uh, proportional response should look like? No. <laughs> we, we, we will have some okay, guidelines. So which, which makes cyber, cyber security even harder. Yeah, well, we'll have like we have in 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 other areas of war. We have in land war and air warfare and everything. We have definitions of certain things that are considered to be acts of war. Mm -hmm. And But there's a lot of things that are left out of that or that are purposely left to be kind of up for interpretation or very fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, if, 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 if I'm a country and somebody commits an act of war against me, one that's well defined. Now I have to take a particular action, right? I've got to respond. I've got to do something. But if 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 they commit something against me, I say, well, I could interpret that as an act of war, but you know, I'm going to be nice this time and let you off, and I'm not going to, you know, that leaves me a lot more room for diplomacy and maneuvering around and things. So we, 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 while there's certain things that we do definitely want to have classified as act of war, acts of war, there's other things that we want to be on that fuzzy edge where we, we can use those as a part of our diplomatic maneuvering and, and, and also we can use them in case of, uh, uh, well, we got, four of these fuzzy things. So yeah, they're definitely acts of war and we're gonna go attack you. Okay. Right? And, and, and so there, there's always gonna be a, 
good degree of fuzziness that uh, that, that, that countries want. They don't want that certainty, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and, well, so a few years ago, Iran shot down a U.S. drone uh, in the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, the U.S. responded with a cyber attack. I believe they took down the facility uh, where that uh, missile was launched from, and they did other damage, other cyber damage to uh, to to Iran. Uh, do you expect to see things like this uh, happening going forward? Forward, where? Uh, you might see uh, a kinetic response to a cyber attack or a cyber attack to a, a, a cyber response to a kinetic, kinetic attack. Oh, oh, definitely, yes. And, 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 you know, the two, cyber and kinetic, are inextricably linked. And, and, and so as a, a country, I need to look at, you know, what am I going to do that's going to accomplish my strategic objectives? And is that best done through something kinetic? Is that best done through something diplomatic? Is that best done through something cyber? And, okay. and you know, what's the, the the least cost but most effective way that I can accomplish what those objectives are? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, my, my my final question. Uh, well, before we end the broadcast, well, second to the last question. Uh, and uh, well, I guess I'm going to dare ask this. Who created Stuxnet? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of theories about that. Huh? And, 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 and yeah, I mean, somebody it was created by somebody. It just didn't, you know, it just didn't oh. appear. Oh yeah. yeah, but that seems to be a question that nobody has a straight answer to. So I just, I just thought I should throw it out there. Yeah, and, and, and I think the people that do have the straight answers aren't in a position that they can give those answers. Yeah, probably. The only uh, analogy I can uh, draw to that is you're asking somebody, did you do this? And they're saying, no, I don't do it, but follow that with a wink at you, you know, like, you know, kind of <laughs> like, you know, you, you understand what I mean. But and, anyway, and, uh, and one of the other challenges that you have is there are a lot of people who have a vested interest in being attributed as the creators of Stuxnet. Okay. So, what you know, if I were to infer that I was the person that created it, right, then that gives me a certain air of skill Authority. and ability and, 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 and those kind of things. So, so I'm you know, if, if you ask if I did it personally, I'm not going to deny it, <laughs> right? Because, uh -huh. you know, maybe I'm that good. Maybe I'm that good. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So, yeah, there is incentive to kind of, you know, uh, uh, let that out. So would you, uh, do you, before we end the broadcast, do you have any final thoughts, any uh, advice uh, to keep people uh, safe in the cyber realm? Yeah, and, and I think that the, the the best thing that people can do is is pay attention to what's going around around them and and look for those small things that are indicators that all may not be right you know the emails you get with the 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 too good to be true offers the emails where your boss asks you know can you run down to the store and pick up a gift card for me and, and, and text it to me, the number to me, and those kind of things. We, we watch out for that on our personal level. We can start to keep ourselves safe. Okay. Well, thank you, Professor uh, Fredheim. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, coming on onto the podcast uh, and share your expert expertise with us. Uh, I appreciate this very much, and uh, I thank you for appearing, considering uh, I understand that I'm, I know that you're extremely busy and to take this time. Uh, an hour of your time to talk to me on Insight today uh, is very humbling. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Fernando. You're welcome, and I, I was glad to be on and, and, and enjoyed myself here. So, well, thank Take you long. very much. <laughs> okay, have a nice day, sir. Thank you. Okay. You have been watching Insight. Thank you for joining. Us.